Welcome to our Indie Street Chat. The members of Bloodhound Picks and an occasional guest give their no BS experiences with current aspects of the industry for people looking to break in or make their own production company. Thank you. If you want to tell me about how you got started. Uh, well, I uh, first came out to uh, New York. I went, went to undergrad at Hampshire College and then uh, came to graduate school at uh, NYU Grad Film. After that, I just sort of uh, took some crappy jobs. I operated teleprompters and stuff. And then through one connection or another, I went to work at a place called Laurel Entertainment. I, I was uh, uh, invited to... Uh, go out and pitch them some treatments for a show called um, Monsters that they were doing, uh, which was the follow-up to um, Tales from the Dark Side. I'd actually uh, gone out there and uh, uh, shown a, a feature that I'd written to uh, their story editor, Tom Allen, and he, he kind of liked it, so he, he invited me to go out there. And I'd, I also knew a, a woman who was, who was like there, who also worked there, called uh, Jillian Manis. I'd actually... Uh, they'd optioned a script of mine, you know, that never went anywhere. So I had actually had two connections. Uh, so I went out there and, uh, I'd, I'd prepared some, uh, some outlines and I, I pitched all of them. And uh, then I, I actually had this other idea that I had written down for a thing called Fever Man, which was this, uh, idea about, um, this sort of kind of a little, this sort of weird kind of culty kind of guy. And, uh, the way he, he sort of cured people was by literally drawing the fevers out of them and fighting them. And have to, he, either he would kill the fever and the fever would come out of this, this kind of horrible monster and he would have to fight the, the monster and either he would kill the fever or the fever would kill him. Every time he killed the fever, the, the person would be cured. And, and I, I didn't have much more than that, but that was the idea they actually liked. So they bought that idea and that was that actually... I, at that time, I was working at the equipment room at NYU. I, I ran the equipment room at NYU, which was a hellish job. Uh, and I, I ended up running it for like six years. So they they bought that idea. That was the first, my first feature, like my first professional sale. I mean, I'd sold some little treatments here and there that never got made. And shortly after that, that turned out to be the premiere episode of, of Monsters. And shortly after that, I got a, a call from uh, Mitch... Gallon, who was their, their VP, and it turned out that Tom Allen, who was a very, very nice guy, and would worked at, the, who had been at, at uh, Laura for a long time, and worked, and was actually, I believe, a, a Dominican friar, uh, a, a reviewer at uh, the Village Voice, and he's uh, a very interesting fellow, but apparently he had a heart attack and passed away, and Mitch invited me to work part-time as, uh, to fill in as their story editor, and I, uh, meanwhile, and I was doing that part time and running the equipment room at NYU, and I did that for the rest of the, the first season of Monsters. You know, I was their creative consultant, and I was evaluating material and doing story notes and doing all that stuff for, the, for fully half of the first season of Monsters. And then I came on. Uh, I quit. Finally, was able to quit working for uh, for NYU, which was you know. Uh, looking back, frankly, and then I went to work full time at Laurel. Uh, I wrote episodes of Monsters, rewrote episodes of Monsters, worked as their creative consultant, which is kind of like being their story editor. I was there for something like six years. We worked on a lot of stuff. Uh, Monsters lasted for three seasons, and then I was just their general creative consultant. We did the, the bunch of Stephen King stuff. We did The Stand, which was very good. We did um, uh, how we did we did. Um, a number of other Stephen King things, which were not as good, and 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 a number of other things that were not horror related. And then uh, Laurel would, had been uh, acquired by by one company, and then got acquired by another company. And then they, you know, basically what whatever what what generally happens is when an East Coast company gets acquired by a West Coast company, a West Coast company, you know, during all these big mergers, they always try to they they always want to sacrifice a company. So like to the merger god to sort of demonstrate how they're 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 sort of tightening the ship and they always kill the east coast company because it's far away and no one can hear the screams <laughs> so they they killed they killed laurel um and then they put us out of business and, uh, you know i'd been was married at that point we had two kids and suddenly i uh, had no job and there were very little in the way of, of jobs for for screenwriters, to help play writers, or story editors, or anything like that, on the East Coast at that time. 
time. And I, I did a lot of looking around and didn't find very much. Over the course of the years, I was familiar with what originally had been Empire Pictures and Foots, Charlie Band's company. Okay, yeah. um, and they did, you know, super low budget direct to video movies. But I hadn't really pursued it, so I contacted them. And, and send them some sample stuff. And, and I got a call from Debbie Dion, who was their, you know, help ran. That was, at that time, Charlie Band's wife and also helped ran the company. And she said, um, you know, well, we, uh, we pay uh, three grand for a script. And, uh, and I said, well, gee, we, I, I make something like between original payments and residuals, I, I make like four grand writing a, a 24 minute episode of, of uh, Monsters. That doesn't seem like very much money. And so I said, well, thanks anyway. And, and you know, and then uh, shortly after that, my unemployment ran out. Yeah. And all of a sudden the prospect of, of getting three grand for, for a screenplay didn't seem so terrible. So uh, I called her back and I said, well, look, I'll, I'll do this, but it, it can't be like the way we usually, people usually buy screenplays, which is like you get paid for one draft and then you have to write three or four other drafts for free. It's like, you know, for the three grand, I'll give you one pass. And if you want another pass, you have to pay for it. Anything, any additional thing beyond that, it's got to, it's got to be pay as you go. And she said, that's fine. And of course, having worked a lot on Monsters, I, I knew I could write really fast because I knew that I could, I could, I could do a pass on a, on a an episode. I could do like an episode of, of Monsters in like two days because I'd mm-hmm. done it. You have to write fast when you're writing for TVs because you're writing, you're writing on a schedule. So I figured if I could write, you know, 24 pages in two days, these scripts were like 85 pages. So I figured I could do one in a week, uh, you know, easily. And I started writing these things and I could turn them out in like seven. I started out writing them in like seven or eight days. I could do a pass. By the time I finished, and I wrote a lot of these things over the next three or four years, I think I turned out like over 50 of them. By the time I was done, I was I was turning them out in like four days. So, I, you know, and they were like 80 to 85 pages. So I wrote a lot of them for, for Full Moon by the time I was done. And I think out of the 50 plus scripts that I wrote for them, I think they made something like 30 of them. I really, I really do not actually have a, a precise count of how no. many of them they were made because he, they tend, he tended to like kind of break them up into pieces and re-release them and turn them into, uh, so what, what started out as one became two and a half or 2.3 different versions of them. So I mean, you know, there's, there's kind of a full moon channel, but you can see, a, a, I, I know that there are a lot of my my, the things that I worked for him kind of came out under different names and different and, and different versions. It says, I know that, that that's like Craw the Sea Monster. All is is also like Planet Patrol, and it's also something else. So it's just it's a, very, a bunch of different movies that I wrote for him came out under different names. But they're they're all they're all kind of they're, it's around thirty, I think, okay. ultimately that that he ended up producing and I wrote around 50 and and during the time I was doing that in between the spaces because it wasn't all that consistent I would have gaps and I thought you know I can't I can't just be doing stuff for full moon for this this tiny amount of money I really ought to be writing stuff of my own so I would be writing my own screenplays in between writing screenplays for full moon which I could because I was writing them so fast I thought I can write my own stuff just as fast and so I would be writing my own screenplays you know and and I, I wrote all sorts I wrote a weird kind of wild west fantasy based on the life of Windwagon Smith and uh, something based in the during the great fire of London I mean I wrote all sorts of, of, of different I'm I'm not particularly good at, at selling my own stuff. I, I despite our happily chatting together here, I'm really kind of an introverted person. So for me to do cold calling because I didn't have an agent at this point. I mean, I had an agent briefly when I was working at Laurel, but then I was having trouble reaching her, and then I, was, I finally discovered that she she quit the agency, and that's how I, I I found out that I no longer had an agent. And she hadn't bothered to let me know. So, you know, I was without an agent and uh, then Laurel folded and I continued not to have an agent. And, and I, I thought, you know what, I, I really need somebody to try to go out and, and sell these things because I'm so terrible at it. You know, I, and I knew that, that I was a very introverted person, but I also knew that my wife was a very extroverted person. I would 
come home and, and find her chatting with someone on the phone and it turned out that there was someone that she she'd like called to like place an order to buy something and it's just they got into a conversation they were just chatting for 20 minutes and I thought like that's really all you really need to be able to make cold calls is the ability to call someone on the phone and connect with someone and chat and and just talk up a project and that was it you know, more than any other skill so you know it took me a while to convince her but she you know I did she used her maiden name to do it and we got a, a you know there was there was a book you used to be able to get that the that listed all of the it's it was called the Hollywood Creative Directory and it just it listed names and phone numbers of everyone who was in the business and you could you could get this this you know soft cover kind of a phone directory and um, by this time I had a bunch of different scripts that that she could you know and that, that she could market and after it like took around six months she she managed to we, we got an option on one script of mine I think we, we sold it didn't nothing really happen for a while we thought, all right we got a we got a script option by a, by a big Hollywood company didn't meant nothing to anybody so I kept working for full moon I would talk to people and we'd say well what are you doing so I'm doing these horror movies for for full moon and I said really do you what do you what do you have and it's like and I didn't have a horror script of my own I had all these other kinds of things. And I said, you know, I really should write a horror movie. And, you know, and I looked around and it's like there, there wasn't anything out in the theaters at that time that I thought was, was really scary. And I said, you know what, I should really write something that, that I think is scary. And so I, I wrote, you know, and again, this was in between full projects, so I didn't have a lot of time. And I wrote this thing called Deader, which was simply... My my take on what I thought a scary horror movie would be. I said, oh, okay, so here's here's my scary horror movie. And my wife was not a big fan of horror; didn't particularly care for it. And and she was she was big on this uh, thing called Innkeeper's Back, which was my Great Fire of London script. And I said, well, all right, you want to you want to go out with a Great Fire of London script? You gotta you gotta call places that have Hollywood deals because it's a, you need like a big Hollywood deal script. And so you go, go through this and you can, you can find the, 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 look through the Hollywood directory and it'll tell you this, the places that have Hollywood, the production companies that have Hollywood deals. And so she went through it and made a list. And because she actually didn't know any better, she found, she found Stan Winston's company. And Stan Winston company, of course, did have a Hollywood deal, but not, it obviously wasn't right for, for that movie, but she didn't know any better. So she called up Stan Winston's company. She talked to one of the, the producers there, and she pitched this great fire a London story. And he said, "Well, it, it sounds it sounds great, but it's not the kind. You know, we're kind of an effects company. That's not the kind of thing that we do." And she says, "Well, it has lots of effects. They're burning down London." And he says, "Yeah, but that's not. We do kind of cre you know creature effects. Do you have anything with like kind of creatures in it?" And so she pitched debtor to him and he said well okay that sounds that sounds interesting send us debtor so she sent them debtor he really responded to it and he said well, look do you mind if if i i just sort of unofficially slip this to a few people and he slipped it to a few people and one of them was uh, an executive at uh, and, and like it got, it got really good responses. And one of the people he slipped it to was an exec at Dimension, which is uh, Bob Weinstein at Miramax. That was that was like, I think on a Thursday, we got a call from Bob that Sunday. We we live in Brooklyn. Mm. They're they're based in in Manhattan. And Bob called and asked to speak to Judy because that was the name on the on the page. And uh, you know, I've, I've read like half the script. It's the best fucking script I read, and I don't know. Can you come in on Monday? And we said, yeah, sure, we can come in on Monday. And we went in on Monday, and uh, by the end of the day, they bought the script for half a million bucks. And we actually, uh, shortly thereafter, we, because we didn't have an agent at that point, we actually got a, we got a check for half a million dollars. They handed us a check for, literally a check for half a million bucks, which was uh, an experience that I have never had since. That was certainly a life-changing experience. Plus, the script debtor went everywhere, and apparently, it was a huge. It was a. It, it, it kind of was like a bomb dropped. This, this was. I was like the flavor of the month for a while. So, I, out of that, I got an agent and got a whole bunch of offers, and it was kind of like it was. It was a career.
we're making script. The script itself was not made as it's. Uh, we, we went into development on that, that thing for like a year and a half, and then it kind of died, and then it kind of came back. They they decided that they were going to turn the script into uh, a Hellraiser movie, and they wanted to know if I was interested in in doing the rewrite. And at that point, I was involved in other things, and they said. No, no, not really. I'm not interested in doing that. So I don't know. Like a, a year and a half later, the Hellraiser debtors they went off and they shot that and with another debtor script, another Hellraiser script at the same time. They made they made them back to back in Romania, even though debtor actually took place in the Lower East Side of New York. But whatever. And uh, Hellraiser debtor is yeah, it is what it is, and. Uh, that's that's uh, unfortunately the only version of Dare that's ever going to come into existence. And from there, I, I went off and uh, you know I, I've written a whole bunch of scripts. I, I did the rewrite, the the remake of uh, Thirteen Ghosts, and I've, I've done some other uh, again, mostly some direct-to-video movies. And uh, Hellraiser Debtor was a direct-to-video movie, and uh, I've done some other movies over the years. Most of them have been direct-to-video, and that's. Uh, that's it. So there you go. Since you went to NYU grad school, and a lot of times, anytime grad school or film school is referenced, there's always somebody that makes the comment, oh, well, you don't need to go to film school. Just you know, use that money that you would get for film school and go make your own movie. What do you think? Well, I, I think it very much depends on the film school. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly a, a, a tremendous, there's a tremendous a lot that you can learn working with, with professionals that you're not going to learn working on your own. I mean, all of these things are, are craft, and there are, there are things that it, it very much depends. It depends upon it depends upon who you are, because there are people who can certainly learn by doing and and, and studying their own stuff um, and and studying the work of other people. The same way that there are certainly people who can who can learn how to write professionally just by being on their own and writing and 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 looking at their own work critically but there are also people who can you know no matter how much they write they're, they're never going to make that transition from from being an amateur to being a professional and, and it's the inability to look at a piece of professional writing and to look at a piece of amateur writing and to understand what distinguishes one from the other one of the things about laurel which distinguishes it from most other companies is the fact that we were willing to if anyone signed if you sign a release form we'll you can submit pretty much anything you wanted so we we would read anything almost that anyone submitted and so we we would read or our readers would read just stacks of amateur screenplays that people would submit and it, it really you know when you work at you know, if you if you work at contests you know where people submit their screenplays you know and i've, I've been readers for contests at various times over the years and it's the same sort of thing that people write these scripts and and they they do not understand they they don't realize that their completely amateurish work is different from the work of a professional screenwriter and in the same way people make films that are, are just at an utterly amateurish level and i think especially performance wise the performances and the screenplays are just awful but it's obvious that the director the filmmaker doesn't understand it and they they release this stuff and they think hey, it is really great and it, it it's it's interesting because very often it can look really good and it can, might have very good special effects and the camera work can be really good and in the midst of all this time and money and effort you can have just dreadful performances and dreadful screenplay and the kind of smiling hopeful filmmaker who doesn't understand that they've invested a tremendous amount of time and energy and effort and their money and their parents' money and who the hell knows whose money in something that has absolutely no chance at all of ever seeing the light of day. The ease of production, because these really quite high-end digital cameras, 4G and 5G and 6G, however many Gs, and, and really cheap editing equipment and cheap special effects have put have placed this technology in the hands of people who have absolutely no idea how to tell a story, no idea where to put a camera, no idea how to distinguish between 
performances that are believable and performances that are not. And so a lot of it is just, it's just fodder. In some ways, it's the same with film school. It's just a lot of them are just springing up as, as a way of taking money from people because there's, there's only so much room for, for this material. And yeah, yeah, so well, you can just, you can put it on YouTube. Yeah, you can put it on YouTube. But so what? So what if you put it on YouTube? How does that turn into a demand for the material unless you're, you're putting something on YouTube that's going to attract an audience? by virtue of it being something exceptional. And how do you how do you create something exceptional except by story, by performance, by images, by creating moments that are memorable, by putting by having a, an opening that's that is going to seize someone's attention, by having a structure that's going to maintain a, a, someone's interest from beginning to end and by knowing how to do that. And and yeah, you you may very well be that special person who was able to know how to do that instinct instinctively, but a lot of that can be taught, and you need to have people and schools that have the people who can teach that, who know how to do it, and who can pass on the lessons on how to do it, and that's, it, it's hard to have those institutions. Uh, you can always say, yeah, just take the money and go make a movie, but how many people have taken that money and gone made a movie, and no one's ever going to see that movie, mm -hmm. because it's so going off of that then, nowadays you have so many feature commentaries and interviews and it seems like a lot of directors are more willing to talk about the themes in their work, that audiences consider themselves more savvy. Do you think that plays into how the industry works now? And I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think the vast majority of viewers really just want to, to watch the movie. They want to be taken up by I mean, you always have a certain percentage of people who are like big are movie fans but i think most people just they just they just want to be carried somewhere by the movie more than to be the experts on the movies themselves i think that's always been the case you know you're, you're always going to have the kind of easter egg crowd and it's one thing to sort of you know to have stuff for that for that smaller percentage of the audience but mostly I think the movie just has to work for the rank and file person who just wants to kind of sit down and watch the movie and be transported by it. I okay, know a new term that's coming up for a long time. It was the psychological thriller. And now everybody's saying elevated horror. There's been all the commentary about, oh, well, horror movies are, are smart now. Do you think there's really a difference in it or is it just the the themes are more on the nose where in the 80s for example you had you know, John Carpenter he made They Live which was about Reagan Reaganomics but you could also watch it as uh, the sci-fi action movie you could kind of view these movies from their theme and their plot and separate them do you think oh, um, I think I think horror movies have always plugged into the particular anxieties of their generation, no matter no matter what, what kind of horror movies they were. Slasher movies plugged into the fears of their generation. Horror movies of, of the 50s, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and the radio, the giant radioactive mutation movies, they plugged into the, the kind of atomic fears of the generations and the loss of identity. And I mean, you look at the horror movies from any generation, I mean, irrespective of whether they were considered respectable, any any horror movie of any generation, they're always plugging into the fears of, of that generation. It's never been any different. In a sense, it's it's hard. It's hard when you're in the midst of the generation and in the midst of the horror movies of that particular decade of that particular generation to necessarily be able to dissect it from within. I mean, you, you kind of need a little bit of distance to kind of look back and say, well, okay, what are the defining horror movies? of that time, of that decade, of that generation, and, and say, all right, now, what is that saying about what people were afraid of, what people were worried about, what pe what was what was the, the angst and the, the, the fear that, that's being embodied in it? I think it's always interesting when you see, what is it, the paranoid schizophrenics of a particular generation, what were their fears, what were their paranoid delusions, and then you look and say, oh, yeah, and also, by the way, the horror movies of that generation were tapping into exactly those same kind of fears and delusions. When paranoid and schizophrenics were, were worried about being possessed by demons, you see you have all these demonic possession movies. When they were when they were afraid of the government reading their brains, you have all of these 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 kind of 
movies about government conspiracies, you, you have this weird kind of parallelism between what paranoid schizophrenics are terrified about and what the, the same kind of fear is being reflected in the movies of those generations. So, I mean, I don't know what paranoid schizophrenics are afraid of these these days, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if we see the same sorts of things popping up in movies. But it, it, it's interesting. And, and to say that, that yes, there's, there's sophisticated horror, but I, I suspect that there's, a, there's also a, a good deal of, of unsophisticated horror out there, too. I mean, you can always depend on Eli Roth to turn out his movies. Not, not by the way, that to suggest that Eli Roth's movies aren't about anything, because, of course, they are. And they're also tapping into this, the kind of fears that our society, you know, the fears of foreigners and, and fears of, of other people and what happens when you leave the safety of your home and go off into other places. So, I mean, he's, he's also tapping into, into our kinds of primary fears, too. So I, I don't want to undermine Eli Roth and his kind of thing. Because he's, he's, not, he's not just like, you know, some lowbrow guy. Do you think with cinema in general, there's oh people watch a movie from 30, 40 years ago and then they critique it with a modern eye and there may be stuff that obviously by today's standards are can be offensive or racist or sexist. Should that be handled in that way or should should we more so look at it from the, the period it would have come out? Um, I, I think you, you have to kind of judge it on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I I still watch like the Sean Connery James Bond movies, which are are just sort of utterly awful in that respect. But it's just like I still find them completely watchable. There are there are probably other movies that I find less watchable. But I mean, I guess it it doesn't bother me so much. But then again, I grew up with that stuff, so it's like I I I guess I'm less I'm more forgiving because of that. I mean, I guess you'd have to give me a particular example for for me to respond to it. The only one I can think of is actually a book, Huckleberry Finn, where the yeah. N-word is used and people wanted to get it out. Sure, of. I mean, Huckleberry, I mean, the point is, when I was when I was in grade school, we read Tom Sawyer and we read Huckleberry Finn, and the history of the N-word is very, it's, it's a very fraught one. I mean, I remember reading it and I didn't find it particularly offensive at the time. I mean, I certainly, I knew that that wasn't a word that, I mean, I understood perfectly well how the usage of the word was different in the context of the book than it was in, in the modern context. And so, yeah, I, I, but I understood, I mean, even as a kid in grade school, I perfectly well understood that, yeah, it was being used in a different way then than it's being used now. In the, in the same token, I don't know if you're familiar with a movie called Dam Busters. Have you ever seen it? No, I haven't. The movie made um, about the, the World War II mission okay. uh, to blow up the, the dams on the Ruhr. Okay. Um, which is, it's, it's, a, it's a really good movie with one very odd exception, which is that one of the, the sold, one of the, the airmen who's running the mission has a dog and the dog's name is N-Word. That's the dog's name. And the the code word for the success of the mission is N-word. So mm -hmm. off they go. And so the, the dog's coming in and he shouts, N-word! Ah, ah. And, like, and, and it's like, oh my God, this is horrible. And then they're off to do this mission to blow up the dam in the roar with these, these giant bouncing bombs that like bounce across the water and fall down. And it's, it's all oh, it's so incredibly exciting. They're blowing up. And it's like, and the mission's successful. And the guy shouts, N-word! And it's like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? But it's like, at the time, this movie was made in the early 50s in Great Britain. And it's like, nobody gave a shit. Yeah. Well, but so what do you do? I mean, that is that is an, an historical fact. I'm sure they didn't make this up. It's based on reality. I'm sure the guy did have a dog with that name, and that probably was the actual word that they used at the time in the 1940s. Nobody gave a damn about it the same way that Agatha Christie, the, the name of the, it wasn't 12 Little Indians. It was 12 Little N-Words. That was the name of the, the original name of the book because at the time that that word didn't did not have like it or not it did not have the same kind of extremely negative implication not that it was a nice word but it didn't have the kind of really bad implications in great britain that it does here i mean it wasn't it wasn't exactly a complimentary word but it's it's like darky which 
is not, I'm not, it's a word that I can actually say, I don't have to, I, you know, we, we have not come to the point where I have to say D word, meaning darky. I can say darky. Yeah. Not exactly. A, it's, it's, it's a word that I can use. Uh, and what's interesting is like 10 years ago, I taught a class and I did use the word in discussing the scene, but the word has taken on such toxicity that even in this conversation, I can't use the word. Yeah. For, for fear that it, that it, there would be some kind of serious misunderstanding. And I think that that's unfortunate because it's not like I'm calling someone by the word or insulting anyone. I'm just discussing the use of a word. But there's, there's a kind of a really, what I consider to be a, an unfortunate taboo against the use of a word that, that I, I think is, is, is sort of damaging to, to sensible discourse. But, you know, that's another whole issue, no, I think. Okay. Going on with that, there's, I mean, there's kind of always been an idea of nostalgia where the filmmakers of, you know, a certain time period are trying to relate more to movies that they may have watched when they were a kid. And the kids in the 80s, they were, there was a lot of updated versions of the 50s. In the 90s and early 2000s, there was all the kind of 70s boom. And then now, of course, it's... Yeah, everyone's going back. Oh, I, I just recently saw on, on Netflix all these movies that are taking place supposedly in the 80s. Yeah. It's very odd. And I know... I, I guess it, it, well, it's, everyone's just hopping in the Stranger Things bandwagon. Yeah. I think that's really what it is. Okay. And people will just do that until that until that fad is exhausted. Right. I think that's really what it amounts to. Well, and I know that I've been reading kind of comments of, like, oh, well, you can't make a good horror movie or that sense in the present day anymore the best ones are always the ones set in the 80s now because you don't have the use of you don't have to deal with a cell phone and you don't have to deal with how everybody's connected now and so it's so much easier to you know not be stuck in a cabin in the woods or whatever the major tropes are what are your you know, thoughts on the idea of um i i don't believe that at all uh first of all it's it's not that hard to put people in places where they don't have cell phones. Second of all, I, I think that there are circumstances where you can have someone connected with cell phones and the fact that you're connected can, under some circumstances, be just as terrifying as being isolated. If you are connected, but someone, for instance, can't get in touch with you, can't reach you, that can be terrifying too. So it, it's just it just present it's a, just a different set of situations. I mean, you can always be someplace where your cell phone runs out, or your cell phone is running out, or someone is taking your cell phone away. Any number of situations, or or your cell phone is damaged, or you're, you've fallen in water, and your cell phone is is destroyed. Or, you know, getting rid of your cell phone is is just a very minor problem. If that's the only thing that's standing between you and and a scary scene, and so you can't figure out how to do a scary scene because, my God, you can just call someone's call for help on his cell phone. So I can't write a scary scene. Then you haven't even you haven't even begun to think about it, because it's not that hard mm -hmm. to to isolate someone. I, I didn't wrote a movie about you know it's like oh scary scene. It's like I had like ten people stuck in a freight elevator, in like a tiny little service elevator, like stuck elbow to elbow. So they, well, that's what about the cell phones? Well, their cell phones don't work. They're stuck in an elevator. Well, and that answered that question. No one knows where they are. They're all stuck. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, solve that problem. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows where they are. They can't call anyone. They can't get out of the elevator. There's your there's your situation right there. And you know, and, you know I mean, I'm sure if I if I were to ask you to come up with, with like five different ways how somebody could 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 be stuck somewhere where they where their cell phones didn't work, other than just hey, my, I, there's there's no there's no cell phone service. Well, that's one. I'm sure you can come up with a whole bunch of other ways why and how they don't have any cell phone service. You know, it's just easy. Other than that's the 1980s. Yeah. <laughs> You talked about getting half a million from the from Dimension and being the flavor of the month for a bit. Is that common for from a screenwriter's point of view? I know you always have like an actor or actress or whoever where they kind of have their big peak and everybody wants to use them for a movie for a couple of years and then a new person comes up. I, I, I think I think yes. I think it's it, it was more common than it is now. It still okay. happens. Uh, I think there's much less money now than there was, so it certainly doesn't happen as often as it once did. Okay. There's much less development money around, much less money to just buy screen 
plays than they used to be. Screenplays get optioned, and often they get optioned for very little money mm-hmm. these days. Much, a much scarcer market these you know now than it used to be for buying things, for selling things, for for making things. Generally, um, things only get sold if you can get a package put together. Either they're looking for a filmmaker, or they're looking for um, a writer, a talent director, something that a financing entity can look at and say, "All right, here's here's the the whole deal put together in a package for anything any anyone's really willing to part with real money." It's tougher, tougher mm-hmm. these days for anything to get made. So I guess going from a screenwriter's point of view. If you could talk about the screenwriter's position for film, I know it's different for television where the screenwriter is a little bit bigger, but the idea of creative control and even satisfaction, if you gain satisfaction um, from the work. And, you um, you have to accept that you really, you don't have creative control as a screenwriter. I mean, if you are, in t- as you say, in TV, it's different because generally as a showrunner, you, you have, you know, where you're really kind of a writer producer, something closer to a writer producer as a showrunner or something like that, you do have creative control. But unless you are a writer producer, you are not going to have creative control. You are, you are, the job is considered, even if you are the writer of the original spec, it's still considered work for hire once the script has been bought and you, you can at any time be replaced. So you have to you have to view it as a, as a collaborative process. Producers and executives and director or whoever they're going to come with their ideas, and you can you can do your best to try to to try to persuade if you think that an idea is not is not good. But in the end, it's there. It's, once they buy it, it's theirs. It's very different from a novel where you maintain copyright. You do not. You sell the copyright to your work, or else you're being hired to do something to execute someone else's vision. You know, when it's an assignment, they have the they have the idea, they have the concept, they have the approach, and it's your job to execute that vision. And even when it's when it's your script, they hi- they buy it, and they may have a certain idea as to how they want to develop it. And if if your idea is to, it may be quite different from what you originally wrote. And I've I've had that that happen where I've I've written something and someone buys it and their idea as to how what they want to do with it is very different from from what I wrote. And sometimes I will struggle along and try to satisfy their ideas, and then I'll get kicked off, and then I may be brought back, and then I may be kicked off again. And, and uh, in the end, nothing happens with the project at all. And that's happened too, sometimes. So it's just, uh, you have to kind of, uh, uh, I'm not going to say you, you, you enjoy it, but it's that's just part of the process. How much would you say that? Because I know social media, they say, potentially plays a lot into um, somebody's popularity or they want to make sure that you have enough followers or whatever, but luck and connections versus that kind of talent and dedication that is normally well yeah. well i mean luck you know obviously being in the right place at the right mm-hmm. time is always uh is always valuable but i think i some old saying says that luck favors the, the prepared mind so i mean it, it, luck doesn't do you any good unless you're ready to take advantage of it when it happens and and, and the answer is of course connections are valuable because Connections are going to put you in the right place, going to help put you in the right place at the right time. So, yeah, it's ridiculous to suggest that if you're, if you happen to be the, the son or the daughter of a famous director or a famous production executive or, you know, uh, that that's not going to, to help get you in, in, in through the door. Of course it will. Um, but at, at some point, uh, if, if you, your work doesn't make money, you, you can't keep writing scripts or making movies as vanity projects as, uh, as Hollywood will not sustain that. You, you have to keep delivering. You, have, you, know, you know, you may have one bite of the apple because your dad is somebody famous or your mom is somebody famous, but much beyond that, you, you gotta, you gotta produce. Making movies is expensive. The last thing I really have to talk about is it kind of deals with actually what you're talking about of parents being involved or this ongoing thing where now their parents are involved in the industry and it's kind of becoming this very close knit circle. And then, of course, there's the what's going on now with the Me Too movement and this idea of this power that I guess, however, they want to phrase it, the Hollywood elite hold. Talk about being somebody outside of that and trying to get in and is it more of a struggle now than before or is it i guess that hollywood dream that all these people go to you know 
Los Angeles. Well, I, I think I think that, that a lot of people. I mean, uh, sure, if if you're an insider, you you have inevitably you you grow up knowing people and and being part of the business. You're going to have that inside track, but uh, there are tons of people who, who start out outside, and you know, and they, they take that outside track. But they're always Hollywood's always looking for for the next new somebody, because it's again, it's not it's not Hollywood in the sense that uh, like there was there's a studio system that's 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 mag like like they're you know like uh, MGM's got they got a studio lot and they got they got the the writers and the directors and the lot making movies. No, it's all they're always being brought. They're it's always independent producers, independent development companies that are bringing movies to to studios or that are being manufactured by whether it's Lionsgate or A24 or, or Blumhouse or whoever the heck it is. Studios are essentially financing entities, and largely they're in the business of manufacturing, of, of producing a handful of very high-end movies every year, uh, and that's their business. And and you know they're they're looking at like what's what's the next hundred million dollar superhero movie, and they have a, a team of people who will they'll analyze the, the the handful of, of movies they're going to produce. That's what they're interested in. That's what they're looking for primarily. And and other movies are being produced by other entities, you know. And, and basically, the way this happens is a lot of they're, they're looking for two two million, three million, five million, eight million, ten million dollar movies. And, and a lot of times, these things are being put together. They're being sandwiched together by all this. We can get a half a million dollars here, five million dollars, two million dollars here, fifteen or five hundred thousand dollars here. We can get the rest from overseas, and the rest from some kind of kickback from some states or from. from government and it's just it's all just sandwiched together in this way which is why when you see when you see the, the credits it's like it's like four or five different production companies because they've managed to to put the money together from all these different companies and somehow or other they make it happen so it, it's like it's a, it's a very complicated process these days to get a movie made because you, you know no one quite has enough they don't have enough resources to, to just finance a movie on their own. It's like we got some money and we're willing to you, you give, you know, get us these elements. We'll give you so much money. All right. I can, well, I, we can get so much from here. We can get so much from there with overseas elements. We can get so much from there and somehow you make it happen. That's that's kind of how it, it, it all gets pasted together. Guess I'm not even sure if that was the question you asked. Oh, no, that's... that was perfect. I guess kind of going off of that and talk about it um, with Disney. I know a lot of people are kind of complaining about this now since they bought Fox and they're owning you know they're complaining about they potentially be maybe making a monopoly and then the only thing in theaters anymore because how much it is to get theater or these tentpole films do you think there's going to be a burst or do you think what do you think is the future I guess of kind of filmmaking and storytelling and well I mean, uh, I mean certainly I, 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 in, a, in a rational world antitrust laws would have would have broken that up because I think it's it's really it, it's gotten way too big and it, it, it's very much it, it's you know but given the, the the horrible state of our government that's probably not going to happen I mean the, the the consolidation is probably going to continue to happen because these big companies continue to make these big movies but it's there's also the problem because the bigger they make the movies it's like very often you'll find that the difference when you're when you're making a movie that costs like a couple hundred million dollars and some of these big movies literally cost that much the difference between being in the red and being in the black can be can hinge on the success or the failure of a single movie the movies on that scale and yes of course when it's you know like the last avengers movie it's like it, it's such a, an enormous monolith it, it almost can't lose money but on the other hand you can, you know, what if it did lose money? What if people started to see it and say, that is a bomb, I'm not going. You know, that that movie cost half a quarter of a billion dollars. If it bombs, it could, it could have a disastrous effect on a major company. And it doesn't take many big flops. I mean, you remember when, when Disney released Mars Needs Moms and, and John Carter, and both of them were in, incredibly expensive movies that probably close to half a billion dollars to make those two movies and release them. And back to back, they both were disastrous bombs. And no 
doubt that they, they no doubt were uh, were rather surprised when that happened. And it, it wouldn't take something like that happening to, to, to just implode one of these major companies when they put that much money into a handful of enormously expensive movies. That would be a, that would be a serious problem. I mean, I, again, they're they're quite diversified because they also own they own television stations and they own the parks and they own lots of other stuff. So, uh, you know, they, they could very easily be cushioned against that kind of disaster. But it would be really damaging to a big country, a company like that, for that to happen. I'm I'm kind of straying outside my area of expertise. But. Oh, I guess last thing, and then I can let you go. Of I guess if you just kind of wanted to talk about finding that satisfaction still and why you still do it yeah, well, just I mean, the future of it in general and i mean uh, obviously it, it would be it would be great if uh if i could if i could get another feature made and sold uh, i mean that's that's all we, you know we, we still have people uh, out there out there working trying to sell my features uh, in the mm-hmm. meantime i'm still doing still doing direct to video still doing stuff for streaming mm-hmm. this thing doing animation stuff doing whatever i can do um i mean if you're going to work as a writer if anyone is, then the satisfaction has to come from doing the writing. And if you if you're not if you don't enjoy sitting down in in front of a computer screen and actually doing the writing and and getting lost in the world that you're creating, you're in the wrong business because that's what most of it consists of is just doing the writing. And if if you're not enjoying that, then you got to find some other line of work because mm-hmm. that's that's what most of it is going to be. It's just you alone in front of a screen. I mean, so long as that continues to be satisfying to you, and and presumably you can you can make a living at it of some kind, then then you ought to be able to keep on doing it. I mean, that's about it. How many drafts would you say? Gone it it very much depends. It depends on the project. Okay. Um, some some things come together very quickly and very cleanly, and it's only a few drafts, and some just you just hammer away at it forever. So it just it, it very much depends. There's no law, there's no rule about it. Okay. Bloodhound Picks podcast is produced by Josh Lee, Craig Dram, and Kyle Hintz. Music by Raymond Seed. Audio editing by Kyle Hintz. <laughs>